Jeremiah chapter 24. There's a tree in Australia. It's called a breadfruit tree. And it produces fruit on its branches at an early stage of its existence. And as it gets older, the fruit then is grown from the center part of the tree. And then when it really gets old, it's growing at the, the root of the tree. And I thought that was so interesting because that's kind of like uh, those of us that are older, you, you know, um, we should hopefully be more seasoned and available to be a blessing to others, to have fruit for others. It reminds me of the, the visual that the psalmist gives us in Psalms chapter 1 of the tree planted by the river of water and it's due season that it produces its fruit, you know, and of course fruit is for others. And so as believers, we are to be fruitful, aren't we? In all stages of life, it, it doesn't stop. There, there's not a point where you have reached and, oh, I can now rest. No, it never stops until we go home to be with the Lord. There's no retirement for the believer. There really isn't. I remember years ago, <clears throat> Pastor Chuck had been talking about retiring, and he was probably about 78 or so, 80 years old. And all the pastors kind of rallied together and said, nowhere in the scripture does it talk about a pastor retiring. You can't find that anywhere. And, and so he continued on, and he continued on till the day the Lord took him home. He was definitely a trooper. And there's no retirement for us. We are to be fruitful all the way through. Oh yeah, we have our seasons, just like fruit trees have their seasons, but we are to be fruitful. The Bible doesn't speak of fruit as the Bible does speak of fruit as the manifest evidence of one that one may expect from life in which the Holy Spirit of God is living and reigning in that individual's life. And so if the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you, then there will be fruit from you because God produces fruit. And as we come to today's message, which I've themed Be Fruitful, Jeremiah 24, we're going to talk about two types of fruit that, that God has um, given to Jeremiah as a vision or possibly a, a great example to uh, the, the two parts of uh, Jerusalem and the children of Israel. <clears throat> and we'll get into that in a second. But let me just give you a little bit more background so we understand this. Understand that Jeremiah is not a chronological study. You, you can't read chapter 1 and just kind of flows through. It's really a, a group of messages to different kings in different periods of times. And so they've broken it up into sections. Uh, in chapters 1 and 10, we have Jeremiah's mission. So God speaks about his mission, what, what's his plan for his life, Jeremiah's life. His call to be a prophet, a call to send a message to the children of Israel and so forth. And then 11 through 20, uh, he talks about the covenant that God had given to Israel and how they broke it, the idolatry, the sin, you know, getting into the the other nations' uh, worship and forms and of idolatry and, and, and so forth. So... And then verses 21 through 29, which we are in, it's talking about the judgment of God coming and it's very near. And of course, that's into uh, the captivity of Babylon. And 30 through uh, 39, then it changes from that point on and we start seeing the new covenant, the promises of God. I, I can't wait to get to that section because I always love to, to read about God's promises, God's faithfulness, God's love uh, for us. And then 40 through 51, Jerusalem has has definitely fallen. And then in 52, it kind of gives us a, a historical overview of the book. Now, Jeremiah himself was born in 648 BC. He grew up uh, as a contemporary of Manasseh's uh, grandson, Josiah. Josiah was that uh, king who became king at the age of eight, and he began to purify the land. And so that was the time that Jeremiah grew up living only about two miles from Jerusalem and coming from a priestly family. He had been uh, intimately acquainted with uh, the situation there in Judah. He knew what was going on. He grew up in it. And so he was probably the right guy to call to ministry to preach uh, a, a message of judgment on them. Uh, he was called at the age of 20, at the age of 20, which I find interesting. Uh, men my age... And men 40, maybe even in their 30s, sometimes we have a tendency of looking down at uh, younger people because they don't have 
the experience or the education and, and so we we kind of play them down in a sense and don't think that they're worthy enough or capable enough to to perform a task or to perform uh, you know some sort of service but we find in the Bible that that's really contrary to what God does I, I just love the fact that God does the impossible he does the things that we don't think that you should do because it's his work I think of Greg Laurie he started his ministry at age 20 over there in Riverside 20 years old Raw, Raw was young. A lot of these Calvary Chapel pastors were young. I started at the age of 26 when I became a believer and started this ministry at the age of 32, 33. And so um, God does use young people. Uh, yeah, they make a lot of mistakes. Yeah, they don't have a lot of wisdom, but, but they sure have a heart for the Lord. And they're willing to take steps of faith that uh, other people are not so much willing. I, I know at a at a... Being at an older age, sometimes I have a tendency of being hesitant and waiting on the Lord too much. And I know that frustrates some people. You know, well, we need to get moving. And like, I understand, but I'm, I'm old now. I like to take it a little slower. Not like I used to, you know, just jump into it and get into trouble, you know, and then hear about it. You know, where young people like to, let's just do it. Let's see what happens. And, and I like that kind of attitude and I'm looking for that type of attitude where we can just jump into it and see what God does I mean if he does something wonderful if he doesn't uh, hey we tried at least let's not complain let's not uh you know blame Let, let's just try again and see what the Lord Lord will do uh, through that but it's interesting that Jeremiah and, and this is what's interesting about Jeremiah he objected to it all he's a 20 year old and God says I'm going to call you and Jeremiah says no I'm too young I don't have the wisdom I don't have the ability. And that's humility, right? God had told him uh, not to say, I am only a child. I said, don't say that to me because I can use children because it's my work in an individual. That reminds me of Moses standing before the bush. Lord, I can't speak. I'm not going to go. I said, okay, then I'll use your, your brother Aaron to speak for you. God will find a way. God will find a way, and he does equip us. The history here in this chapter and the kings that he's speaking to here um, is Jehoachin uh, and others who had been carried away to Babylon. You can find uh, more on them in Second Kings chapter 24. <clears throat> they were in exile or are going to exile. Uh, their logic seemed reasonable those taken into captivity were the ones that were being punished. And then the ones that were remaining behind in Jerusalem were the ones that weren't being punished or rewarded in a sense. And again, however, God's logic is in our logic. And, and so if you were to ask uh, Jerusalem, what do you think of this whole captivity thing? What is your take on it? Well, they probably would have said, well, we see the people being taken, so they're the bad ones. And we see the people being left there, so they must be the good ones that God's leaving there. And that's not necessarily true. And that's another thing about God is that sometimes he, he does things that are that, that's not normal, that's out of the box, uh, that people would never have thought of. You know, I think of the Calvary Chapel movement, you know, where Chuck... It wasn't even Chuck's idea. That's way out of the box, right? When his wife comes along and says, hey, let's reach the hippies. I'm like, oh, hippies, I want to do that. And that's way out of the box for a pastor to listen to his wife. <laughs> way out of the box. But he did, and they reached out to the hippies. They brought Lonnie uh, uh, Frisbee in to see what a hippie looked like and acted like and see what a Christian uh, looked like as a hippie and so forth. And they went with it, and boy, did God, God just bless the Calvary Chapel movement because they thought out of the box, the Holy Spirit worked. And then the criticism that Chuck got, because he was raising up young men, men that didn't go to seminary school, men that didn't go to Bible college or so forth, men, men that he just saw were called of God for the ministry, who were men that realized that they had no ability, that it wasn't their strength or power, but they were just willing to serve the Lord. They were willing to do anything for the Lord. And so you'll hear these guys like John Corson and Raul Reese and, and Mike McIntosh and Greg Laurie and, and so forth. You'll hear the stories about them starting. You know where they started? Cleaning the toilets. Sweeping the halls. 
Greg Laurie tells, talks about going to Home Depot, well, probably some other hardware store, and buying a, a doorknob and replacing it. That's how they started. Greg says, Chuck, I want to help. Oh, you do? Here, go buy a doorknob and, and replace that one over there. You want to help? I mean, that's a shocker for somebody that feels, well, no, I'm called to teach. I don't change doorknobs. You know. Really? Then you're not called because you have to be a servant. You have to be a servant. And, and you know how you know you're a servant? John Corson really describes this very well. He says, you know when you're a servant? When people treat you like one. <laughs> that's when you know you're a servant, right? I mean, that's so true. When they start walking all over you, you know, when they start expecting you to do stuff and, and serve, then you know, boy, I am a servant. And, and God said, they're the greatest. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then be the servant of all. So here what we do is what we have are two pictures uh, of two baskets of figs. And, and God gives Jeremiah, whether it's a vision or, or, or what, or, uh, or he literally gives, the, gives him these baskets, which I don't think he literally gave them to him, but, but gave them this vision or dream uh, of baskets, uh, two baskets of figs, so one that was very good and one was very rotten. And they were offered up in, in the temple there. This event here in chapter 24 took place around 597 and 587, and it is the second deportation into the Babylonians' um, nation. Let's go ahead and read verse 1. The Lord showed me, that is Jeremiah, and there were two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord. Now, these baskets were set before the temple of the Lord, and the Lord showed him this, and that's why I believe it's, it, it's a dream, not necessarily something that's really happening. You don't go and, and take bad figs uh, and, and give it to the Lord, which we'll see in a minute here. Uh, you always give the best to the Lord, not the worst, not the leftovers, uh, but the first, the tithing, you know, the tenth goes to the Lord because it's his, and it's not ours, otherwise it's... Malachi says it's, it's thievery. And so um, that's why I think that this is more of a dream. Figs are interesting because we have analogies of that even in the New Testament. Remember Jesus and Luke was walking along and he saw a, a fig tree and it wasn't bearing fruit. You remember that? And so he's like, why isn't this tree bearing fruit? Oh, let's cut it down. And then there was a guy there and he says, well, let's not cut it down. Let's hold on for a second. And I think it might be a reference to this 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 chapter here in Jeremiah because the guy says why don't we wait why don't we take the soil and let's let, let's turn the soil over and let's fertilize it and let's see what happens and in a sense that's what's going to happen here the guy's going to take them into captivity but he's not just chopping them off he's not just going to disown them he's going to give them some time and then he's going to do a work in them so there's these bag baskets of figs there before the Lord after Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of uh, Jeokim, king of Judah, and the princes, or the leaders, the officers there of Judah, with the craftsmen and smiths. Now, uh, they believe that there was probably around a thousand craftsmen that were carried away into Babylon. And that makes sense. I mean, you're a great nation. You want to pluck out the guys that are gifted you know, so that they can help your kingdom. And so you have guys like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego who were a part of this deportation. And they were singled out because they had some uh, wonderful skills uh, from Jerusalem and had brought them to, to Babylon. Now, Jehoachin had already been taken into exile along with the officials and craftsmen and artists. And the Lord is showing Jeremiah two baskets of fig that had been placed there in front of the temple. The baskets of figs were used to be as offerings unto the Lord of the first fruits in the temple. And so whenever you had a crop, then you would harvest that crop and the first tenth of that crop you would set aside unto the Lord. You, you can go into uh, the book of Ruth and you can see that with uh, Boaz and, and Naomi. And not only do you provide for the Lord, but you also provide for the poor. So the first tenth goes unto the Lord, and then you harvest your your fields, and then whatever's left over, the gleaning, you just leave it alone because that was set aside for the poor. God provided. So God took his, you got yours, and then you also provided for the poor. And the poor came along afterwards, and they picked up the leftovers, and that's how the Lord fed them. Uh, what what a great welfare system. You know, that, that's perfect how that works. 
And it works because you're abiding by God's rules, God's commandments. And so if you're abiding by God's rules and commandments, guess what? God will bless you. It's when you, when you don't follow God's rules and commandments that God can't work his full work in you because you're not being obedient to what he's already told us to do. And that's what's so neat about God. We have to understand that when we stay within the line of what God has drawn, then God will bless us within that lines. Now, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have grace for us because grace is always there. Even for the most wicked person that lives on the earth, you know there's grace there. He's alive. He's breathing. I mean, that is definitely grace because God could just wipe him out. So there's always grace there for us when we fail when we don't measure up. But do you want to be used of God? Do you want to fully surrender to the Lord? Do you really want God to do a great work in you and through you? And not to glorify yourself, but to glorify Him. Because that's why we were created, to glorify Him. That everything that we do would speak of Him and not of us, but of Him. And when we understand that, then God begins to work in us and blesses us because we keep within those boundaries. Verse 2, one basket had very good figs, like the figs that are first ripe, and the other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad, and so rotten figs and good figs. Then the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? Jeremiah is in one of those positions that we oftentimes find ourselves in. When your boss or the pastor or someone above you says, so what do you think? And you're going, oh, okay, so like, okay, so what does he want to hear? Does he want to really hear what I think? Or does he want me to make something up that makes him feel good, you know? And so Jeremiah says, what do I see? Um, 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 figs? I see figs. I see good figs and I see bad figs. That's what I see. Don't ask me any more than that because I don't know what there is besides that. And so he was just being very front and probably a little shaking in the knees, you know. I don't want to say the wrong thing here, Lord. I want to presume something here that you're trying to say. All I see is figs. Some are bad and some are good, which cannot be eaten because they're so bad. Now, what is the meaning of these figs? Verse 4, again the word of the Lord came to me saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah. So the good figs are representing those that were being carried away into Judah. Those are the good figs. Whom I have sent out of this place for their own good into the land of the Chaldeans. So God had taken those people in Jerusalem and he, he was the one that initiated the whole plan of capturing them and taking them into captivity into Babylon and and removed them from Jerusalem and took them to the land of the Babylonians. It was God's work. And you remember if you remember Kings and Ezekiel and Isaiah and so forth because of their idolatry. And so he was punishing them. He goes on, for I will set my eyes on them for good. And I will bring them back to the land. I will build them and pull them down and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Now you would think, again, if you were to ask Jerusalem, so who are the bad people? Well, the ones being taken into captivity. And that's not true. God says these people I will actually work in. They're being taken and some of even by their nose with, with rings, you know, and like slaves and animals. But I'm going to work in them. These are my people, and this is my work, and I'm going to work something good in them. He says in verse 7, Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. So obviously the implication is that they had turned away from God. They weren't seeking God. Their hearts were far from God. And God says, I will take these people and I will let them be brought into captivity, but I will then give them a heart to know me. God's the one that gives us a heart to know him. 
we can't decide to know him. He has to have grace on us to introduce himself to us. And then we have to make that choice to know him. But he will literally give us that opportunity and then we take that choice. And then when we take that choice, then we know that he is the Lord and that we are his people and that we'll return to him and we will have a heart for him. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace, through faith, you've been saved. And it's not of yourselves. And so it's God's grace to us that he introduces us and he changes our heart. Now, how does that work? How does he change a heart? You know, I've thought about this for many years, how God changes hearts. It's interesting because I've seen it throughout the years in ministry and even before that, how some people come to the Lord and how they're so different. You have some people come to the Lord and they're very slow in their walk. They don't rush into it. They don't get into things. They're just kind of waiting. They're just kind of watching. They're just kind of seeing. They, there are a lot of questions in their heads and they're trying to figure it all out or, or they're just not as, as passionate about it. And so they're very slow. And then you get others who are just like, oh, man, this is awesome. This is great. And oh, how can I get involved? How can I do something? Whoa, whoa hold back. <laughs> Pulling the reins there a little bit. You know, let's hold on. Let's first understand a few things before we get involved. But how does God change a heart? That's a work of the Holy Spirit. I think that the first step of a heart being changed is when a heart realizes that it's sinful, that it's evil. When, it's, when it realizes its depravity, that it really is no good, that there is nothing good in us. Now, I understand that's foreign to some of us. Whenever I say that, someone says, well, don't get down on yourself so bad. You always say you're no good. Well, we are no good. It's what the Bible says. None are righteous. No, not one. And you compare yourselves to one another. There might be some that are a little better than others, but compare ourselves to God. (laughs) There are none righteous. No, not one. But it doesn't mean we can't do good because God works in us and through us and he produces good things, good fruit in our lives but we have to realize that we don't deserve anything and again it's not coming from a low self-esteem perspective we don't deserve anything we don't deserve to be in church we don't deserve to know god we don't deserve our relationships we don't deserve to be breathing but yet god has been gracious enough to allow us to breathe to know people to create relationships and all of that it's his grace and we need to see that from that lens And when we understand that, then we begin to appreciate who God is. We appreciate all that he gives us. And when we appreciate, appreciate leads to what? To helping, serving, giving, and so forth. Because you're appreciative of that individual. Someone does something good for you. What's the first thing you're you're thinking? Well, I want to do something good to them too. They buy you lunch. Oh, I got got to take them up to lunch because I want to buy them lunch. I can't just let them buy me lunch. You know, because you get appreciative of what they've done. And so it starts there. And then God's Holy Spirit takes you and he starts to change your heart. Again, born again, that new heart. In fact, when you look at the verse six there, it says build or or tear down, plant, uproot. The word comes very close to what 2 Corinthians 5.17 uses as new creation. That, that tearing down, that building down, that uprooting, what is that doing? It's creating something new. And so God does that with our hearts. He, he tears it down. That's why it's so painful. You know, as a child, it's painful to grow at that certain age. What is it, around 8, 9 to, to 12, well, actually all the way to 16 for some people. You know, your bones are like, stretching and pulling and I can remember and I only remember Modesto I don't know why maybe the other ones didn't have a problem with it but but Modesto would come home from school and he would just sleep all day long and and we finally realized this because he was growing he didn't grow much but (laughs) I'm sorry that one just God set that one up I wasn't even on my notes (laughs) but but we we just knew his bones were growing and it was painful you had to give him aspirin or whatever just to help them through it all and so forth it's growth is painful growth is always painful but it's needed right 
is definitely needed. And so God creating that new creature in us, you know, there's some uprooting, <laughs> there's some cultivating, there's some tearing down that has to take place. And we need to be willing to allow God to do that. We need to be willing to allow God to do that. Otherwise, we'll never grow. We'll never become those new creatures in Christ Jesus. And we're all there. I understand that we are going through things, you know, uh, relationships, jobs, all of us, whatever it is in your life that you're struggling with, angry about, all of those things, we have to view them from the lens of Christ. He is allowing us to go through those things for a reason. And I think it's one reason is, is to glorify him through it. That if we can somehow glorify him through this, then he would receive the glory. If I'm suffering, Lord, let me suffer with joy in my heart and glorifying you. So that when people look at me, they wonder, what is wrong with that person? Why are they so happy? Why do they have such joy? It must be because they know the Lord. And they understand that those things are temporal. They don't last forever. As my wife would say, in a hundred years, will it matter? In a hundred years, will it matter? That's how she says it. No, it won't. But it matters now. Yeah, I know it matters now, doesn't it? It's hard right now. It's difficult right now. And you want to give up. You just don't care anymore. But you know, every day is a new day. Every day is a new start. And if you trust in God, he can create something new. That's our God. Now, if you were in captivity for 470 years and some guy came along and said, hey, God said, get up because uh, we're moving. What? (laughs) We've been here for 470 years. Yeah, right. Get lost. You're a little crazy. No, it's a new day. It's God's day. And God sent Moses to deliver his people. And then he brings you right up to the ocean. Oh, so this is deliverance, huh? Right, right up to the Red Sea. This is where we're going to die. Okay. Yeah. Great, Moses. Wonderful. Wait a minute. It's a new day. God divides the land, the water, and they walk through it to a new land. That's how God works. It's a new day. I think that's why when he tells us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, it's always our daily bread. Give us our daily bread give us our daily needs it's not hey provide for us for a year and then i'll see you then no it's daily why because god wants you at his knees at his feet all the time praying and seeking him that's where god wants us and glorifying him so he's creating something new Um, ezekiel kind of used something similar like that in eleven nineteen. he says then i will give them one one heart and i will put my or a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. And so God will work in Israel. He will take their hardened hearts and he will soften them. God will soften them. On another occasion, Jeremiah reminded the exiles that uh, they would find God in this place. Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen. He says, and when you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. You'll find me. God wants to be found. It's not like this hide and go seek, you know, and you're looking for him and he's nowhere to be seen. It's like God says, okay, 10 is up, find me. And he's standing in front of the tree and not behind it so that you can see him if you just seek him. Because he wants you to see him. And he wants a deep, intimate relationship with you that all that matters is, him and pleasing him and he'll get you through whatever it is you're going through as difficult as it may seem i remember years ago i was reading a a book and in this book it was i think it was by dobson he was talking about a man who who was called to ministry back east and he felt um <clears throat> he felt called to california and so he had made connections with a church here. He had made connections with a person that he was going to rent a house from. And he was going to come down here and serve and, and work his way up through this church. So he sold everything, everything. All he had was, was what he could bring in his vehicle. 
And he got here and the church went under. It's like, okay, so what's going on here, God? Maybe you have something else. And so he went to go uh, move into the home that, uh, that was promised to him and it wasn't there available for him anymore. And so now he's really wondering what is going on here? And the story stops there. Do- Dobson said, nothing ever happened. He says, how do you explain that? How do you comfort someone like that? You don't know what God was doing in that situation. And you may never know what God was doing until you get to heaven and you ask him, what were you doing in that situation? And there are times where we just don't know what he's doing and it just doesn't seem right, doesn't seem fair. But what's important is we know that he's God, he sits on the throne, he's our savior, we have eternal life and we need to glorify him in every situation that we find ourselves in because he is our God no matter what it is. And as difficult as that is to say, it's even more difficult to do. I understand that completely. And that's why God gives us grace. So when we fall, we get back up. It's a new day, Lord. Let's start again. And it's a new day, Lord. And that's what grace does. He gets us through. Now, we come to the meaning of the bad figs. Verse 8, as the bad figs which cannot be eaten, they are so bad, surely thus says the Lord, so I will give up Zedekiah the king of Judah, the prince or politicians and leaders there, the the residue of Jerusalem uh, who remain in this land and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. So apparently there were many of the Jews that had fled to Egypt also trying to escape this whole thing. And so God says, "Uh, you're not going to escape. You know, I'm going to give you up also. So the poor, the bad figs were the ones that would really God deal with. Now, he didn't deal with them the way that he dealt with the good ones, did he? But when you look at the history of it, these were the people that were left over. These were the Samaritans. These were the Jews that were half-breeds. These were the Jews that did not get God's full blessings. And so they were kind of in the background. And that's usually what happens. God is gracious and he allows us to continue on, but we don't get the full blessings of the Lord that he wants to do in our lives. I don't know how many times I've missed that. I've missed that bus because I didn't follow through. I missed it years ago when I was on my way to work. And as I was on my way to work, I came to Belgrave in Wineville, and there was this accident that just happened. So I pulled over, and I see a couple of people coming out, and, and I heard it very clearly. Go pray for that man. He was on a motorcycle, went head on with a vehicle, and he was laying on the ground. And he was moaning and screaming. He says, go pray for him. And I started to walk over there, and more people were coming. And I says, no, there's too many people. I'll direct traffic. That's what I'll do. And then the Lord says, go pray for him. And I says, no, Lord, I'm too embarrassed is what I was. So I didn't pray for him. I went to work and explained why I was late. That Sunday, I found out that they put him in an ambulance and on the way to the hospital, he died. Talk about missing God's full blessing. I missed it. I missed it completely. And I remember going up to uh, one of the elders at the time, because I, I, was, I was nobody then, just like now. And, and I went up to him and said, I, I need to confess my sin because I missed it. I should have talked to that person. I should have prayed with him. I should have invited him uh, to know Christ, but I didn't do any of that. And I feel so bad. And the person just says, oh, don't worry. God's gracious. And at the time, I didn't understand. I was like, wow, okay, just off the hook like that, you know, and there's no conviction, no, no, you should have done the right thing, nothing like that. I'm like, okay. But I, I didn't understand until years later when I was on my way uh, to church and I was on Crown, I believe it is, that's where the park is. And there was an, ac- or actually someone called me, that's right. They called me and said, you need to get over here right away. There was an accident in front of our house. Uh, some kids had hit the the dumpster, trash dumpster, and they just went flying out of the car. They were all over the on the, on the grass and so forth. So I got there. Uh, paramedics, fire department were all there. And so time to redeem myself. And the Lord says, go pray with them. 
And so I just walked in, and of course the, the, the police was like, who are you? And I go, well, I'm a minister. Minister? No, pastor of a church. Oh, okay. So they let me in. And I went to every kid, and I talked to them. I prayed with them. I asked them if they knew Jesus. And a couple of them uh, were crying as, when I mentioned Jesus and how much uh, he loved them and so forth. So God is gracious. It's a new day. He gives us another opportunity. So we miss blessings because we're not obedient, because we're not willing to take those steps of faith or adhere to God's word. It says, I will deliver them to trouble into all the kingdoms of the earth for their harm, to be a reproach and a byword, a taunt and a curse in all the places where life shall drive them or chase them in, in, is the Hebrew or even force them to go. Verse 10, and I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they are consumed from the land that I gave to them and their fathers. So this was to really frighten them as Jeremiah speaking to them about this fruit of figs, the good and the bad, and that they would be a byword and they would be dispersed and not known. That would scare me enough to say, okay, I need to change something here. I need to change directions. I need to get back on track, right? I need to be fruitful and not unfruitful. And the Bible talks a lot about fruit, right? We, we, we read stories in the New Testament about fruit. We, we read a lot of Old Testament stuff in the Pentateuch about fruit, the first five books of the Bible about fruit and so forth. Fruit is a good thing, but fruit can also be a, a bad thing, as Jeremiah uh, proclaims here one commentator said a figure of spiritual productivity stemming from the concept that the recipient of god's grace should return his time and energy to god in appreciative service that's what fruit is because he's appreciative and so he's going to give back he will have fruit now when you look at the people here what kind of fruit was god expecting from them remember when the disciples um Ask Jesus what work should they do in order to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, this is the work you do. Believe in me. Believe in me. That was it. He didn't say you need to go to church. Didn't give him some commandment. He just said, believe in me. That's a fruit. That's probably the biggest fruit of all is that you believe in him. Now, what does that mean, believe in him? Because that implies a lot. And that's a lot bigger than just believe in him. Don't misunderstand that. Believe in Him. Trust in Him. No matter what's going on in your life, believe and trust in Him. He's God. He's more than capable. He's big enough. He will take care of you. Believe in Him for your daily bread. Trust in Him for the little things every day. Hold on to Him. Cling to Him. Acknowledge Him. Seek Him. I mean, it's all of that together. It's all the fruit that is produced in the various situations that we all experience in life. Whatever that is. What do you do when you're without a job? I'm blessed to see people who don't have jobs come here and start serving while they're not working. I think John, John was without a job for quite a while and he was here all the time. He'd come here on Wednesdays, he'd be here on Fridays, and he'd help me out because he's not working. And so he said, well, I might as well do something for the Lord. You know, Fred's doing that right now too. You know, so they see the opportunity that God has given them. And that's not to say that they shouldn't find a job. You know, and when they get a job, John was gone. <laughs> you know, and he was working. And that's wonderful. But he was being fruitful while he wasn't working and glorifying the Lord while he wasn't working. Instead of sitting down in front of the TV playing video games and watching TV all day long, you know. He was getting plugged in. Because church is about getting plugged in and serving. And we need to understand that. There are metaphors that are used for fruit in, in the scriptures. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. There, there's a fruit that comes from, from the Spirit of God living in us. There's love. There's joy. Those are all fruits of the, of the Spirit. The fruit of God. The fruit of God. We're fruits of God. John 1, verse 12, he gave us the right to become 
children of God. We're his fruit, his offspring in a sense. There's fruit in death, believe it or not. That's the best fruit of all when we see our maker face to face. Wonderful. Jesus was the first fruits to resurrect. We're the seconds or thirds or hundreds of thousands of death. Fruit of the lips. There's fruit that actually comes from our speaking. Uh, We were just talking about that earlier. Just saying a kind word. Lucia just said a kind word and it like changes everyone's attitude in a, in a workplace. You ever go to the DMV, you know, and, and, and the people behind the counter are just, uh, try saying one kind word and see how they change. You know, there's fruit in the way that we, we speak. Fruit unto holiness, Romans six twenty two. Fruit of the wicked, wicked have fruit. It's wicked fruit. There's fruit of self-centeredness. Again, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And that's fruit. Uh, fruit in season. We find that in Psalms 1-3. The, the tree that's planted by the river one and is due season, it will give out fruit. And so fruit does come in seasons. You might not have fruit because you have no work and you can't provide for your family at that time, but you have fruit in church because you're serving, you're glorifying God at, at, in that area. Now, someone might come along that's very judgmental and, and say, oh, well, you're worse than an infidel because you're not working and you're lazy. You know, but that's not true. You just can't find work. Fruit of the gospel. Fruit of righteousness. Fruit which demonstrates repentance. That's one that we don't really talk a lot about nor demonstrate in the church when we offend someone or do something that's inappropriate. We don't really repent and show the fruit worthy of it. We, we don't go back and really say we're sorry and then show the fruit of that sorriness because there's worldly repentance where you just say, oh, I'm sorry, and you just go on and live your life. But if you're really sorry, you're going to pay for it. You're going to make up for it in a sense. And we don't see a lot of that taking place in the church any longer because it's so hard. Uh, we're, we're so computerized, right? Where we don't want to do anything face-to-face anymore. Uh, meetings, you don't even have meetings anymore face-to-face. I remember the old days, we're going to have a meeting. Let's everyone drive down to Alhambra. And everyone's going to sit in the room and we're all going to sit there with the managers and so forth and we're going to talk. And now it's, we're going to have a meeting. Go sit in, the big, in front of the big screen and we're all just going to talk with you guys. It's no longer personal. You know, let's text one another. Hey, I, hey, how you doing? And we're texting. That's our relationship now. Instead of, in, instead of going and seeing relatives, you now just text relatives. Hey, I'm talking to them every day now. Texting here and there. And now church has caught on to that, right? It's no longer, let's go to church and see a live pastor. Let's go to church and look at a screen. And there's no connection with the senior pastor there. We've lost that. And now I'm hearing that I won't go that route. Fruit that demonstrates repentance. Uh, The unfruitful works of darkness are contrasted with the fruits of light. So many different fruits. Let me give you a a couple of scriptures. They're close to my heart and you probably have heard them too about fruit. Uh, Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 12. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And so God has given us grace. He's given us different types of gifts but it's according to the Holy Spirit. And so we need to respect that and honor that in one another that we all don't have certain gifts. I don't have the gift of of singing. You don't want me to sing because I I just am so off. I tried it one time and someone, uh, I literally did, I tried to end the service. You remember how Chuck used to end the services? He'd always say, uh, was the Lord bless the something like that and i tried it you know and afterwards one of the the young gals came out and says well you gotta take the word and kind of go a little longer like where right there i don't hear it you know i just forget it i just can't do it you know, that's not my gift but don't hold me against i mean i'm gonna sing i'm gonna love to sing i still love singing i mean you can hear me in my car and i'm singing to the lord a joyful ugly noise It's God's grace, it's his gift, and he gives them to his children as he sees fit. And we need to respect that and honor that. If prophecy in in portions of their faith, in service, in their serving. Not everyone can do what Randy does. There's only one Randy. 
There's only one Rudy. And, And some just can't serve that way. And oftentimes they reveal that by being grumpy or complaining. And obviously maybe they don't have that gift of serving. They need to find another, another place to, uh, that God maybe has for them that they can find some joy and peace at, you know. But not everyone can do that. And it doesn't mean that, because that, um, I can see from their perspective, well, how come I don't have that gift? And, and we can't covet someone else's gift either. We have to receive what God's given to us and not covet someone else's gift. He who contributes in liberty, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does act of, acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And so these are gifts that God has given to the children, his children. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 12, talking about the manifestation of the Spirit, For the common good to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to the other the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by one Spirit, to another works of miracles, to another prophecy, another the ability to distinguish between spirits, uh, to others various kinds of tongues, and others the interpretation of tongues. All these are inspired by one and the same Spirit. And, appro- and appropriations to each one individually as God sees fit. Uh, Rich Woodson will be teaching this coming Sunday. And um, he loves apologetics. And I love apologetics, but I don't have the time to get into it because I also love going through the word. And so they're two different animals. And so you have to tackle one or you tackle the other, you know, you, you're going to lack in one or the other. And so I'd rather lack in that one than lack in just teaching through the word. He loves it. He doesn't teach. He's not full-time ministry. He works and so forth. So he has the time to really focus on that. And so he started coming here. I want to use that gift that God's given him. I want to drain him of all of that that he's learned throughout the years on apologetics. And so that's why we have him now doing the men's studies and they're going to be topical studies on apologetics because I think we need to hear more and understand more of the doctrines of the Bible, the theology, the study of God and so forth, eschatology and various things like that that I just don't have the time to do. But here's a man that has that gift and he's able to give that out. We were blessed at the last men's breakfast. And you'll, I'm sure you'll be blessed uh, this coming Sunday as he will be sharing with you, I believe, from, from Romans Chapter 1, I think he was telling me, and he was saying that um, uh, the title of it was going to be No Excuses, so that sounds exciting. I'm going to have to listen to that one. So God gives those gifts, and, and, and we need to allow those gifts to be used, and so I want him to be used here so he can minister to the body here along with myself too. So Peter talks about uh, the oracles of God. He says, whoever speaks as one who utters oracles of God. Whoever renders service as one who renders it by the strength which God supplies. So if you serve, it's done in the strength that God gives you to do so. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Everything, whatever it is, God should be glorified. Period. I just got a, 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 an awakening this last Tuesday. It was at Rawls' Tuesday study. You know, I've been doing this for a while. And, and when I was younger, like I said, you're kind of gung-ho. And so I understood that it has nothing to do with me. And so when people would say to me, good message, I said, praise God. It has nothing to do with me. Don't give me compliments. I would tell them, don't give me compliments. I don't want to hear it. Because your head has a tendency to do this. And just because people are in and out, you know, and, and, and so you have to say that quite often because you get new people coming in. And so then as you get older, you get tired of saying it. So you just kind of stop saying it. And so now when people say, oh, good message, and you're like, thank you. Thank you. Because you just, you don't want to go through the whole spill. No, don't tell me that because my head, you know, it's God. And, uh, and it's, you know, I've said that like a million times. Okay, thank you. I'd just rather just say that and move on. But I just got a, a, a an awakening. Uh, Danny Bond was uh, teaching, and 
he was basically talking about um, ambition. What is your ambition? And he said, um, as a pastor, people will come up to you and they'll say, good message, wonderful message. And, and we are to respond, no, it was God's message and it was him be the glory for what was said if anything good was said. And so we give him the glory. And he basically said, don't ever stop saying that. Don't ever, because the day you stop saying that is the day that the enemy will come in and start puffing you up. And then your, your desire, your ambition will start to change because now you're trying to be better and hear that over and over again. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to you, Lord. Glory be to you. And I'm going to continue to say that. I don't want the glory. I want the glory to be his no matter what I do. Let it be his because it's him working in me. I wouldn't be here without him. I wouldn't know him without him. I'd be serving him without him. I would continue to be working with Southern California Edison, making a lot of money, but dying and going to hell. That's where I'd be. And so if I'm here, it's because of him. So glory be to the Lord. So whatever you do, do it unto the Lord and to his glory.